Okay, great. Uh, so this is agenda. So we have the introduction uh, by Professor Paola Migliorini about Agroecology for Europe project and about in general what are, what are living labs and uh, how the project is developing living labs. Then we will have the example of the three living labs developed by Agroecology for Europe and they are uh, developed in theory in three countries. So we have one in Italy and uh, uh, me and Paola will present it. Then we have a living lab developed, uh, uh, being developed uh, in uh, the UK and uh, Lindy Winder uh, will present it. And then uh, the last uh, uh, pilot living lab from the project is the one in the Netherlands and uh, Jan Assing will present it. Uh, we will have then time for questions about this experience of the project about living labs and then there will be some uh, further presentations about more developed living labs, especially there will be uh, the example of Mertola Future Lab in Portugal and we have the presentation by Rosinda Pimenta. And then uh, we have the living lab called the Rete Semili Rurali in Italy, and Matteo Petitti will, um, le yeah, will present this living lab. And then we will have a final moment of questions and discussion about living labs in general and about these experiences. Uh, I think it would be nice, I don't know if you can speak in this, uh, uh, in, in this platform, so it would be nice since we're not so many people to have a short round of presentation. So maybe just telling your name, the institution you come from, and maybe one word why you are interested about Living Lab. So I can start about uh, presenting myself. So I'm Alicia Fosso, and I'm a researcher uh, from the University of Gastronomic Sciences in Italy. And uh, currently I am working for the project Agroecology for Europe, uh, especially in the work package four that is uh, um, focused on the, um, on the strengthening of the network of agroecology in Europe among different stakeholders, so from farmers to policymakers, researchers, uh, and other kind of stakeholders. And the work package for which I'm working, coordinated by Paola Migliorini, is coordinated the creation of these uh, three living labs uh, of the project. So I don't know if someone else wants to present himself or herself. Alexander says that uh, he cannot, we cannot. Okay, there is no possibility to speak. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so then if you have questions or comments, you can write in the chat and uh, we will uh, take them from the chat. Or maybe we can ask to write in the chat uh, quickly your name and your role. Sure. Unfortunately, I can't read the chat because I have the full screen of the presentation. I can try to... Yeah, okay, I'm reading for you. Um, Lindy, of course, she, she will need to speak later, so we need, we need to find out how to give her the... Yeah, floor. sure. Um, then Alexander Wetzelar Isara, Lyon, France, participatory approach in agroecology. Um, then uh, Lucy Zviga, um, hello, Lucy Twitter here, current Master Agroecology student at Isara Lyon, taking part of a group work on agroecology territories, um, you know, under the methodology of Wetzel et al, connected to uh, agroecology for AU research team at Isara. Thank you, Lucy. Then there is uh, Cohen Vervoort, a network builder at uh, European Network of Living Lab, uh, involved in all ready. Thank you very much, Cohen, for being with us because it's very important to share also with the our sister project, you know, the, the approach. Thank you. Um, then there is co-creation productions. Hi, I am Margaret Goris. Uh, <laughs> Ciao, Margaret, from Wageningen and uh, University Agroecosystem. I'm involved in work package four, five, six of Agroecology for Europe. Um, then Nikki Rose, hi Nikki. Uh, Nikki Rose, producer, director, heritage 
Protectors Documentary in uh, Progress Founder and Director of Crete's Culinary Sanctuaries Educational Network that I visited, organizing uh, academic study tour and seminars Crete, Greece. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and yes, Alexander added that uh, he is the coordinator of Agroecology for Europe, Director of Research of ISRA. Thank you. Uh, Sasha Petrovic. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sasha Petrovic from the organization Zelena Transitia, based in Belgrade, Serbia. We are currently working on two Erasmus projects on agroecology. Welcome you, Sasha. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jan Hessing, uh, Jan Hessing from Wageningen, uh, also involved in the project in the Dutch uh, Living Lab of Agriculture for Europe. Matteo Petitti, Action Research Coordination at Rete de Semi Rurali, the Italian Rural Seed Network. Uh, the system is, ah, okay, waiting for approval. Okay, maybe you need to, later on, uh, I'm quite sure that we need to, to let you speak, of course. Corrado Ciaccia, hello, Corrado. Uh, researcher at CREA Italy. I'm involved in agroecology for Europe and different other projects, working with participatory approach and trying to work with Living Lab. Hello. Erika Angarita, um, researcher in Tunen uh, Institute, Germany, doing uh, her PhD in tools for monitoring transformation process using Living Labs in European agriculture and looking forward for living lux experience uh, and to do case studies. Thank you, Erika. Maria Luisa Parracini, Parracini. Hi, Luisa. Um, good afternoon. I am in the advisory board and I am not sure um, I should take part in this session. Of course, you are welcome, Maria. You, you are very welcome to be with us. Um, para, Parasto Ma, Madavi. Hello, everyone. I'm working on work package two of agroecology for Europe from Germany. Thank you for being here. Um, and yeah, Maria, you are highly welcome. Alexander wrote. Sylvia Kay, um, working at the Transnational Institute, TNI, International Research and Advocacy Institute based in Amsterdam. Not involved directly in any living labs, but have been working with Jan Hassink and Mark Ritt from Wageningen University on the creation of a new agroecology network in the Netherlands. I happen to listen and learn more. Okay, uh, for the moment there are no more, um, let's say, contributors. Um, and in the meantime, if I'm not... I can share the screen again. Okay, yes. And then we can see uh, with the technical assistant how we can give the floor to the other speakers because I think it's quite an issue. <laughs> yeah, in the meantime, I ask here, my guy. Okay. Strange, it worked now for me. <laughs> I, I was allowed to join in. <laughs> That's great. Okay, I have I have understood why. Um, I see your name uh, below. You you have to send a request, and uh, me and Alicia, I think we can allow you to enter. Sorry, okay. we, we, didn't, we didn't know that. Excuse me. So, <laughs> we don't know this platform. We're yeah. <laughs> just in, uh, sorry. So if you can Good please. Now. Yeah, if you can please. Uh, press the button, uh, uh, allow me, no? Allow it. it was a green button before. In the top right somewhere. Top yeah. right top of the screen, you see a green button that uh, echoing. Now I see that you are coming and I give you, yes. Okay, nice to see you all. <clears throat> now we are starting to populate this black <laughs> room. <laughs> okay, so. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, we, we go, if you agree, we go to the next because, okay, yeah, well, the presentation, we did it uh, in this uh, way. It's okay. Alicia, what do you think? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's better than uh, if the person who speaks after can present again herself or himself. Yeah. Now you can see my screen. Yes. Right? Sorry, yes. Every time I have to... Okay. So. Okay. Okay. So um, I quickly uh, present uh, for the okay. The majority of the people here know very well about the project, but 
anyhow, there are still somebody that are not fully involved. So the Agroecology for Europe uh, uh, project, it's a, a coordination and supported action financed by uh, Horizon 2020 uh, program. Um, and uh, it was uh, financed by European uh, Union uh, together with uh, another sister project called Already. Um, we started the January 21st this year and it will go on for three years, so December 23. And you can find here the website uh, of the project. Next. Yeah. Okay, those are the partner. It, the project is coordinated by, Isa, by Isara. Can you... Uh, there is something... Alicia, can you go back to the presentation? Sorry. No. Can you see the... No, there is logged me no? in. I don't know why, because I'm in the no. page of the presentation. Now we see the slide of the partners, but not in full screen. It's, yeah, now I it's see full screen, the full partners. Screen now. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, but I... <sighs> Just a moment. Okay, oh, excuse me. Now I see it. Sorry, excuse me. Okay, the, the, the project is coordinated by Isara, by Alexander Vedzer and Baptiste uh, from uh, France. Um, then there is other university, uh, some uh, NGO. Um, yeah, and so let's say it's a mix no, of, of research and multi-actor uh, approach. Next, please. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the, let's say uh, the, the project uh, was uh, in particular, um, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, developed uh, by the European Union to uh, sustain, to develop the partnership co-creation. Co uh, so it is also a role inside, no, or in, in connection with SCAR, with the, and the, the, re the, the final, the final um, outcome of the project, uh, project uh, is, of course, so let's say, the general European agroecological uh, network, no, to speed the transition no, towards more sustainable agri-food system. Um, but it's also the uh, to, to develop uh, a, 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 no, the, ro the roadmap and a final uh, partnership uh, program. Uh, although in the meantime, uh, European Union was also faster and the SCAR already finalized now the draft document for, for this uh, process. Next. Okay, so uh, within this uh, project that they have a eight work package, uh, um, and uh, many different activities, very rich. There is the mapping work package one, there is uh, uh, financing, uh, no, uh, source of, for agroecology, a policy, um, and, and our package also about the development of a, um, of a hub for uh, exchange knowledge. In particular, there is also this focus about giving lab and research infrastructure. And here in this slide, you find basically the concept uh, uh, of the three main component of agroecological living lab. So the development and implementation of agroecological principle and practice with a clear definition of defined network and, and uh, interaction with uh, all kinds of stakeholders. So the, the, there is a strong focus on co-creation of knowledge and, 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 no, and co-conception of practice among different pa parts of, act of actors. Next. Okay, so the work package four have this uh, specific action on uh, develop a context-based and site-specific solution to answer to this central question. So we, which are the mechanisms that will strengthen the agroecological research and innovation ecosystem in Europe? And to do that, the project uh, was, was uh, written. Uh, so we propose to have three countries as, as cases, so in particular the Netherlands, UK and Italy, uh, where we will facilitate the creation of three living labs, uh, in particular, um, uh, let's say, no, a practice-driven organization to, to foster collaboration and a real-life environment, so an arena where there is uh, 
real uh, no, user innovation process and new solution for, for real problems, so to, to deal with reality. Um, and so one output of this uh, of this work package and this subtask is to identify practical mechanisms to strength uh, agroecology research and innovation in Europe. Okay, after this, let's say, uh, presentation. Um, okay, this is my last, probably, sorry. Um, yeah, there are there are three uh, three steps uh, to do that. So we have we, we decided uh, to to do three uh, specific uh, um, yeah step to develop the living lab. So the first one is to define obstacle and com and common objectives uh, involving all kind of stakeholder again farmer, policy maker, researcher, any any, no, any kind of of action. The second one is to implement you know, the previous defined objectives. So to start to, to understand, to interact, and, and to do the next, after identify you know, a common uh, challenge, a common ob objective that we, we collaborate with inside the Living Lab. The idea is to, uh, to implement. And the third step is to disseminate. So after the first and the second uh, workshop, uh, the the result uh, is to is to learn is to learn from those uh, this activity and to um, disseminate uh, in order to as much as possible create a uh, no uh, multiplication effect of living lab. Okay, I leave the floor to um, Alicia. Okay. Uh, so uh, now I will present you the Italian Living Labs that we are developing under the project Agroecology for Europe. And this Living Lab is coordinated and organized by the University of Gastronomic Sciences in Italy. Uh, this Living Lab is on a regional scale and the biophysical dimension is a mountain valley called the Val Varaita uh, in the region of Piedmont uh, that is uh, relatively near Turin, this valley. Uh, in terms of socioeconomic and cultural dimension, the Living Lab wants to valorize the biocultural diversity of the valley, the phenomena of neuralism in the mountain areas, and also um, the dialogue and the collaboration um, among producers and other stakeholders uh, with different worldviews. So we are trying to involve stakeholders uh, with different approach to agriculture so that we can create a um, wider uh, dialogue and uh, confront among uh, different point of views. And in terms of uh, network, um, in this valley already exists a network of enterprises. So the Living Lab has aims at uh, enlarging and strengthening the already existing network among producers. But then uh, we also want to involve other kind of uh, stakeholders, such as policymakers and researchers, among others. And to do, yeah, to reach uh, this objective, uh, we will develop an agenda uh, toward common uh, agroecological innovations. Um, here we can see a bit the added values of this uh, Italian living lab. And especially there is the, the fact that uh, um, this living lab will create a model that can be reproduced in other uh, Italian and European valleys. Uh, then there is uh, the value of recognize the bicultural diversity of mountain areas in general, so not only of this valley, but then to um, enlarge this uh, valorization to other uh, mountain areas. And the last uh, added value is the fact that uh, Valvaraita um, can be uh, considered uh, a, a fertile territory with a movement of people, especially young people, that are repopulating the valley uh, mainly through sustainable agriculture and related activities. Um, here we can see uh, the possible objectives uh, and innovation focus of this living lab, and uh, we uh, started to define uh, the possible objectives of the Living Lab through a preliminary questionnaire uh, that we uh, shared with the participants and uh, of the Living Lab before the first workshops. 
And um, here in this list, we can see which are the topic and uh, crucial issue that are more important for uh, the stakeholders involved. So we can see the, that the most um, interesting topic for uh, the stakeholder, uh, for the stakeholders, is uh, issues related to food sovereignty. Uh, and then also there is a great interest in develop a food a district of food uh, in this valley um, to develop a sustainable low seasonal tourism. And there is also interest to discuss and find solution, uh, solutions regarding uh, the access to the land and also the relational economy. So to develop a local commercialization of the products that are uh, produced uh, locally. Um, here we can see uh, how we choose and how we select the stakeholders involved in the living lab so we base the selections on the technique of snowball sampling indeed uh, we we organize the preliminary meeting with uh, collective producers and food transformers that are already rooted on the territory and a meeting with local administrations with the objective to um, uh, to find uh, uh, possible actors uh, to contact uh, and to involve uh, in the living labs. And then uh, we, um, uh, we also based the selection on uh, PhD research from uh, Chiara Bassignana, uh, being a PhD student from the agroecology uh, research group uh, of uh, our university. So uh, during the prelim preliminary meeting, uh, we had the objective uh, to define uh, if it was possible to collaborate uh, in this valley uh, for establishing uh, a living lab. And the participants were uh, uh, mainly uh, collectives. Uh, so we had the CSA, a collective garden, uh, and a collective of, transformer, of food transformers. And then uh, there were uh, the researchers from uh, the agroecology team of uh, UNISG. And um, during this uh, meeting, we had some brainstorming activity to start uh, discussing about the possible objectives of the Living Lab, the actors to be involved in, uh, in this uh, laboratory. And also uh, we discussed uh, uh, what are the possible opportunities and obstacles um, of developing a, li a Living Lab in this specific area. And the outcomes, as I said already, uh, was a rich re uh, list of uh, possible Living Lab actors and uh, some agroecological themes uh, uh, to implement the living lab. Then we had an, uh, the meeting with local policymakers uh, and uh, the participants were six municipalities out of 11 of the Mountain Union. And also in this case, the outcomes was uh, a great list of producers to be contacted and uh, a great interest in the, among policymakers to participate and collaborate in the Living Lab. Uh, here we can see the types of stakeholders that are uh, yeah that are uh, participating in the living lab. Uh, so there is, there are CSAs, food transformers, uh, different kind of farmers, both agroecological but also conventional, certified and not certified organic, as well as certified biodynamic producers. Then there are there is a collective farm. There are NGOs uh, and activists. Uh, there is uh, uh, there are um, agricultural associations, but also farmer networks, um, and uh, there there are yeah policy organizations, citizens, and researchers and students. So the first workshop uh, will be organized in uh, one week, uh, next Friday, uh, in the municipality of the Valley. And the organization uh, is um, made by uh, the university in collaboration with an association uh, uh, because we want to 
since we want to organize uh, a methodology and facilitation process uh, that is based on myotics and action research. And this association is especially um, uh, uh, expert in these issues of action research. So it can help us with this approach. And why we're organizing the workshop um, to first of all strengthen the network among producers, policymakers, and researchers, researchers uh, identifying the needs for agroecological innovation and developing action strategies to reach these needs of stakeholders. And the agenda of this workshop will be uh, the presentation, of course, of the project and in general of agroecology. Then there will be a round table with the participation of participants. And then uh, the main activity will be an activity uh, divided in group on specific agroecological themes. So the one that we saw before about food sovereignty, about the development of uh, uh, sustainable low seasonal tourism, but also access to land. And, uh, um, and the last one will be the development of uh, the district of food. And during this group activity, the stakeholders uh, will discuss uh, their needs related to the thematic, but also the talents that they can invest, uh, that yeah, they can invest to reach uh, their needs. And uh, they will discuss the obstacles uh, um, that uh, are present in the possibility to reach the needs that they have. And uh, finally, there will be um, uh, a round table where each group will share, of course, the results of the activity. And behind or at the top, like uh, uh, of all the Italian Living Lab, of course, there is a research activity. And the title, the title uh, might be uh, Expanding Living Labs for Transition to Agroecology, a case study from Northern Italy. And the objective uh, of the research is, as was already um, defined before, is like to define pathways for expanding living labs in mountain areas. And we, we developed the research questions, uh, that is, what are the main factors affecting the creation of living labs? So um, through the online questionnaire, the group focus during the workshops, uh, we will uh, um, understand which are those factors. So uh, defining factors as uh, the reasons why uh, people decide to create a living labs, so to join and work together and collaborate. And then uh, we will go uh, through understanding the objectives. So, so um, the reasons, yeah, the objectives that motivate people to um, collaborate uh, towards uh, uh, those objectives. And then, of course, also we evaluate the obstacles and the supporting forces um, behind this collaboration and this. Uh, um, um, this working together for the objectives. And therefore, the data analysis, of course, it will, be, it, uh, will depend on the collective data and also on the methodology, but we will probably uh, relate it to the factors that we defined. Uh, we will use some kind of SWOT analysis. And so, yeah, from our side, uh, Italian Living Lab, we, we are at this stage of like we starting defining the stakeholders uh, and uh, we had this uh, uh, co-creating process of defining the objectives of the Living Lab. Uh, and we will have the first official workshops in one week. So we, we already developed uh, a certain part of the preparation of the living lab, and then uh, the more concrete development will occur uh, during the first workshop and then with the uh, other workshops that will happen next year. And now we can, uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can uh, uh, ask, or we can uh, uh, leave the floor to Lindy to, um, 
to present the living lab in the UK. Does anyone have any questions before I take over? <laughs> Okay, Alicia, I'm going to assume that um, I just press on and if there's any questions for you, they'll perhaps come in the chat or at the end. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Lindy and um, I'm part of the Coventry University team that is working um, on agroecology for Europe. Uh, we're working particularly on the finance package, but um, we're also supporting this work with um, a living lab developing living lab in the UK. Um, so Alicia, if you can do the first slide for me, please. So um, we started off, we thought we were in a, a, a bit of a head start because um, we, where our uh, research centre is based is somewhere called Whiten Gardens. And it's a 22 acre site on the outskirts of Coventry City. And, and it's been the home to the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, which is part of Coventry University. Um, and it's also home to a community farm, a 60 year old organic demonstration garden and a heritage seed library. So we had this location that had a lot of um, kind of exciting overlap already. And in 2019, Coventry University bought the plot of land. And so these stakeholders gathered together um, to produce an ambitious 10 year business plan to turn the writing site into a living lab. If we could have the next click, please. Um, so initially, this is almost sort of prior to the project, this seemed to be a perfect fit for a UK living lab um, that was going to be created as part of this new project. But we're reliant on the main stakeholder, which is Coventry University, um, and they're yet to adopt this business plan. And because the business plan at this stage is still a 10 year plan and our project is a three year project, we've um, we sort of had to rethink the time scales. And um, so for that reason, um, we've, we've sort of come up with a, a, a sort of sideways solution. So we go for the next um, clip, people, Alicia. So yeah, so we've considered what the other groups are doing. So after me, um, you'll hear from the Netherlands team and they are, looking at a, a, a national living lab. And you've heard um, that they're looking at a regional living lab in Italy. So we were wondering whether we could look at sort of what, what we can take from the writing site and have a look at something local. And um, so we have a smaller scale, but maybe sometimes on a smaller scale, those things can be easier to replicate if they are um, successful. And, and it gives the, uh, from a science perspective, I think it gives, um, a little bit more scope to be able to look at these different sizes of projects. So uh, we are hoping to um, bring together some of the <clears throat> excuse me, stakeholders at the Wrighton site, um, but to benefit quite an urban area, small local area within Coventry City. Um, so if we can go to the next one, thank you. Um, so the benefits of a local, a local living lab so physical distance is one thing. It's much easier to meet together, um, assuming COVID restrictions are, are not denying and meeting up in person. And, and so people can get easily to those activities and meetings. And something that's local, we imagine there would be very similar um, needs within the community that we can tap into and, and find something that sort of suits all of, or a, a very specific local identity and need and um, we would like to tap into local networks that already exist and, and we'll talk about that more on a later slide um, and yeah as I said before something that's small sometimes can be less um, frightening to replicate uh, and so the idea of having a small living lab if, if, we, if we get something that's a good model we can have a few more of those popping up and it, it's not perhaps such an overwhelming prospect and um, so right next thank you so we picked the area um in coventry called falls hill and if we have the next clip oh, yes. thank you um yeah so i'll just get it up on my screen as well so i can see what i'm gonna say um so yeah the 
Falls Hill in Coventry, um, there, there was a census in 2011 and there were just under 20,000 people living there. And um, if we go to the next one, it's one of the most ethnically diverse wards in Coventry City. And next. And yeah, so it has the lowest proportion of households who are not deprived. So it's a funny way of saying <laughs> it basically has a high level of deprivation. So that's based on um, the, the, the de deprivation dimension measurement that takes that into account. It considers levels of employment, educational, educational attainment, health and adequacy of housing. So on those measures, um, this particular area of Coventry was considered the most deprived. If we can go to the next one, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is quite interesting. So this year, there's a new health centre has been built in this particular area of Coventry. Um, and it's what's called a, a passive house health centre. You may be aware of that. I, I wasn't, but essentially it's a very, very green building. So although, and although, you know, this is again, not exactly agroecology, maybe we felt that there's, that was quite an interesting overlap that in this deprived area, um, something that's looking at health, which obviously agroecology and eating um, good local food can encompass, there, there does seem to be a kind of investment at the moment in doing something for Falls Hill, which has got a green um, element sort of climate wise, which may well fit with what we're doing. Um, so final one, please, Alicia, on this page. So yeah, so what we're, what we're hoping to do is if we can connect residents in what is very much an urban area to growing and eating healthy local food, it could be a real opportunity um, to improve diets and general well-being. So yeah, it's again, partnering with a health centre, looking at the farm, uh, the community farm that's available locally and trying to bring those things into a city environment and um, would we hope to be what, what our living lab would look like. Right, so if we could go to the next one, please. So what already is going on in Falls Hill? So there's something called the Coventry Food Network, um, which is fairly new, but it has grown out of something else. So um, yeah, it's a, a multi-agency food partnership involving statutory, voluntary and private organisations across sectors. Um, and it came from something called Feeding Coventry which was a charity that was set up in 2016. Um, and yeah, and it's a great vision that they had to make Coventry a food resilient city when no one goes hungry. And so they have already done a lot of the groundwork, if you like, for us that they'd, they've um, have some connections. There's already networks and overlap going on in this sort of area of food. So we just want to see how we can connect that in with how that food is produced and, and where it comes from. Um, uh, yeah, with the potential of uh, bringing in some of these stakeholders from right in. Uh, so yes, just uh, again, a little bit more history, um, but that there is a Coventry Food Charter um, to redefine the ways in which we produce, transform, consume, distribute and recycle food. And again, that's something we're hoping that the researchers at the university um, and, and what we're learning from this project and from the other living labs might be able to feed into this, um, this chart. Right, so we'll go to the next one. Oh, yes. So the first workshop. So originally, I think we were hoping that our first workshop would have been encompassed in this early stakeholders meeting that, that produced the 10-year the business plan that I spoke of to begin with. Um, but actually, you know, as, as can happen in these things, sometimes you have to take a step back and go in a different direction. So um, we haven't had our first workshop yet. Um, we have had some ideas um, and we would like, uh, I think, to do it early next year, proposing it for February 2022. Um, and what we'd like to see come out of it is ultimately building a chapter in the Coventry Food Strategy um, around where food can be grown locally and what's available and how we can bring healthy food to the city. So the, the community farm that exists already on the site where um, the research centre that I'm part of is based, um, 
they're they're really full they're very successful csa and they've got lots and lots of people that want their vegetables um but we'll hope we, you know what we'd like to do is see if some of that knowledge and experience of building that csa could be connected with other people who might like to do that and be involved in something more urban and if there are spaces within the city of Coventry where food can be grown and what can be learned from from this existing community farm that we have and um, we'd really like the uh, language to not just be um around agroecological transition because <laughs> it, it it can be a mouthful sometimes for a lot of people so you know we want to use words you know deliberately we'll be using talking about health and food um public health well-being mental health um and and eating locally and those sorts of things because we think that that will make the connection and it will be agroecological transition but it might be done in, in perhaps more um sort of familiar language to, to the people that we're speaking to um so we've we've identified a number of stakeholders you can see on the right of the slide so the food network that we mentioned um, there's another group support for Falls hill there's a social supermarket um, in coventry obviously there's researchers um, from the university and students that, that we could tap into local schools five acre community farm is the, the farm that i've mentioned uh, the local council there's a gardening group um, and newly this falls hill health center that, that we mentioned right i think it's the last one now <laughs> Thank you. So the objective, we don't have one. No, that's not true. We, we do. But we, um, we'd really like the, uh, the participants to come together at this first workshop without kind of being told where we think they should go, but actually to be able to dream together to think about what they really need and want for Bowles Hill. And um, we need to give them a sort of a space to listen to them um because really they are the experts in that area and they they've been working in that area already and they know what's what works and, and perhaps what doesn't and, and what might be missing so we would like that first workshop to be very much about establishing and co-creating an objective together and then we'll move on from there so we're at probably the earliest stage of the three living labs but there's our journey to this point and um and the plan that we have so far so thank you for listening and uh, I shall pass over. Thank you, Lindy. Are there questions uh, about these two living labs or any comments? If not, we can go to the uh, Dutch living lab. And so we can see a, a different stage of development of this process of creating a living lab. That is, we can see that they are quite different, but then they have some similar uh, characteristics. Yeah. So I leave the floor to Jan. I don't know if Jan can hear us. Or maybe someone else from the Dutch Living Lab presenting it. I'm not sure. Yeah, Jan, I... Jan is, is writing, how can you hear me? OK, um, Jan, you have to request uh, uh, for the green bottom, uh, top, top uh, right of the screen there is a green button where you request uh, to to talk and and share your screen you need to to click there yes and then now i echo now you have to oh, perfect now we can see ah you can see you can also hear me now yes excellent <laughs> it's quite complicated thank you very much uh, paula and, uh, and alice Yes, it's a great pleasure to present our Dutch uh, Living Lab. I think it's quite um, maybe a bit a different story than in Italy and in the UK. Uh, maybe um, I would like 
first we'll start with the starting situation because our idea is was to have let's say a more living lab at a national level so not at the regional or local level but focus at national level and we have several reasons for this I think the main reason is that we have an, an, a national federation of agroecological farmers uh, consisting of different underlying networks. And in our, let's say, in our um, view, they have they had quite a lot of um, farmers that consist of these networks, but they have very limited connections to conventional farmers, limited connections to research to policy makers and also to, uh, let's say, to, uh, to businesses. And we thought that to make this whole transition to, uh, to agroecology and to also the application of agroecological principles, it would be really interesting and, and, and worthwhile to strengthen this agroecological movement and this, the ambitions of this federation. So the objectives of our living labs is to I say to collaborate with this federation and with uh, that and to see how we can let's uh, help them to realize their ambitions in order to by let's say making them more visible uh, connecting all these different separated networks and actors that are not connected now to this uh, let's say all these practices in agroecology and we realized at least that was our idea that it, we also had to develop trust between the different actors so we thought it would not be just one living lab uh, on an annual basis, but we, we, were thought, we were thinking about a series of, of events that would bring together different stakeholders and develop this process of getting to know each other, developing trust and developing a mutual understanding about the value of agroecology. And then finally, in order to join, to make a joint, let's say, analysis of the problems that, that people are facing to come up with a research and action agenda to strengthen the agroecology in the Netherlands. Can I have the next one, please? So we chose for a step-by-step -step approach, taking the ambitions, the visions, and the energy of the Federation as a starting point, and not, let's say, setting up a separate uh, living lab, um, let's say, uh, event joining, let's say, their ambitions. Um, with ambition to develop a broader and a stronger movement, taking the, the Eleni Declaration as a starting point, because we, uh, the Federation indicated that these, these declarations and the, the, these principles were very important for them to take into consideration. Um, also taking into consideration an action agenda with the key challenges that were already identified by the farms that are member of this federation, um, connecting and, and establishing an exchange with the Ministry of, of Agriculture and connection with these more conventional farmers that have an interest in nature inclusive uh, farming. And if next one, please. So we had the first online workshop Unfortunately, it had to be online because of, of the corona uh, measures. And um, it, was an, uh, it was organized in a collaboration with, between the research group of Federation of Agroecological Farmers, uh, Wageningen University Research and, uh, and Transnational Institute. Uh, Sylvia, you were one of the organizers of this, uh, of this first uh, meeting. Um, and as a starting point, we took the challenges and the research themes that were already identified by the Federation as a starting point. So I, as I explained, the focus was getting to know each other to see uh, if we could strengthen a collaboration between research, farmers and NGOs with an interest in agroecology. And th during this first meeting, we had uh, about uh, 30 participants with different, big, different backgrounds and different types of interest in agroecology. Next one, please. Now, this is a bit of repetition. The main objectives from, from, for this first workshop was to um, strengthen the movement, strengthening connections between practitioners, the farmers, the researchers, and NGOs. And let's say, think about a strategy 
to deal with the main challenges that this at mainly the agricultural farmers, but also the movement in the Netherlands are facing. And we realized that this was a first meeting. People didn't know each other. Um, so it, this could not best just be an endpoint, but this is a starting point to discuss, let's say, the, the challenges and an action agenda for the Federation and the farmers. Next one, please. So there were already four different uh, topics identified of four themes. And the first theme was about the policy uh, around agroecology. And the main focus was, was directed to the, having more access to, to land, because we realized there's a lot of uh, first generation farmers that have a lot of problems in getting access to land. And also for, uh, let's say, other types of farmers that uh, have more ecological uh, orientation. So some of them is also very difficult to get access to land because they need more land to, to become more extensive. And with the high prices for land in the Netherlands, it's really, really a big issue. Uh, when you look at this, this, let's say, the policy aspects of agroecology, in this, let's say, in this, in this group, it was discussed that there's a big risk in the Netherlands to see agroecology just as a way to make agriculture more sustainable by, by applying all kinds of technical innovations and applying ecological principles in the farming system and not looking at uh, a more transformative approach in agriculture and in food systems. So the second topic was to get a, a, a better exchange with policymakers and also that, so that they would get to know, let's say, the, 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 the ideals and also the activities and the motivations of the farmers that belong to this federation to also sh discuss with the ministry and with also landowners the issue of short lease contracts because that's a big issue in the Netherlands and to start campaigning campaigning to get real action on the on the on the ground to make steps together and to to realize change uh, in our agriculture and food systems. The second uh, group was discussing about the agroecological knowledge. Um, and they were discussing about, is it not, not time to get, to start a real, an, an institute for agroecology? So we discussed um, the principles of such an institute. Uh, should it be a real institute or maybe a kind of network of farmers and, and researchers? Uh, we discussed the need for having let's say setting up a more regional uh, let's say locations that could serve as a demonstration advice and also research centers uh, context specific and it also let's say focus on the, the challenges our ecological farms are facing and we discussed an important topic to get access to funding for research that is focusing on our ecological farmers we also have two other groups that were discussing issues uh, around the themes of commons and solidarity economy and developing the movement of agroecology. But I think it's too, too, too much now to go into detail in all these uh, in all these groups. So this gives a bit of an overview of the, our first meeting we had in, the, in, in July. Next, the next one, please. Then we were very happy that we managed to get a second uh, meeting live on October 16th. And then we had around 60 participants that all came together in, in Leiden at the university. Um, now this gives a nice overview of, uh, of the participants at the end of the meeting. Next one, please. And you see a, lo a long list of all the different organizations that participated in this, in this uh, meeting. So we had the farmers networks, that were the, first, the first group, the CS CSA farmers, the future farmers, agroforestry, we had uh, the biocyclic vegan ne vegan network, the Stichting the Meter. We had a lot of different NGOs that had an interest to um, to I say strengthen their collaboration with Federation of Agroecology, like Extension Rebellion, but also um, uh, Oxfam Nova both ends, Greenpeace, uh, now again of course the Transnational Institute. Uh, Milieu Defensie, uh, you know, many of these organizations. And I, I think it was really interesting, we also have researchers from several universities, not only from Wageningen, but also from Leiden University, 
Twente University, Utrecht University, Maastricht University and University, University of, uh, of Groningen. So it was really, a, 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 let's say, a, a wide range of stakeholders with an interest in agroecology to meet on this, it was on a Saturday, to meet and discuss the different uh, issues that, uh, that were, let's say, in, uh, on the floor on, during this, uh, this meeting. Next one, please. Um, the program for this day was also quite, I think, um, diverse. Because uh, the participants could first visit an agroecological farm to get really to, to get to know the practice of agroecological farming. Then we had a panel discussion with uh, researchers and different NGOs with statements how they could link to the principles of, uh, of the agroecological movement. We had uh, a visit of the Zapatistas from, uh, from Mexico to share their experiences with their, let's say, struggle in, in Mexico. We had this um, a, a, an explanation of the New Laney Declaration from the Federation and, and show and, and express to all the participants why this, this declaration was so important for them. And also not just talking about it, but also making it visible by, uh, by expression. I will show it in, a, in the next uh, slide. And then again, we had these discussions in these four different thematic groups, talking about how to strengthen the movement, both nationally and internationally, uh, to look at uh, the knowledge for agroecology, but also the policies um, and this access to, uh, to land. And finally, we came up with follow-up follow -up actions and we had a joint dinner. So it was really a very, very pleasant and enjoyable uh, day. Can I have the next one, please? <clears throat> so this, gives, this, I think this picture gives a nice illustration how um, people from the Federation also try to, not only to talk about the principles of, uh, of agriculture, it also expresses in kind of uh, I call it in a, in, a, in a statue. This is the expression of one of the principles about uh, power in, in agroecology. And you see uh, suppressed farmers, you see uh, new farmers, you see the government is looking away, not paying attention to the struggle that is happening. So it, it made people really aware of, uh, of also the political and the power dimensions of, uh, of agroecology and the movement. Next one, please. So here this gives a nice view of, uh, let's say, some of the, the discussion groups, the, the, the mapping we did about the main uh, issues and the main uh, topics in, in, the, in, the different, uh, in the different thematic uh, groups, and we have lunch together. Next one, please. So I will shortly present some of the outcomes from two groups. Uh, one is, uh, is the knowledge uh, group again. Um, so we discussed about what were the, the main um, topics that were of interest for farmers, the, the kind of knowledge they were lacking. It was mainly, you see, they say, they identified they really like to have more knowledge about the soil food web, about vegan farming, no digging, and about different business models. And they also indicated that it's, it's all a very context specific uh, information and knowledge that, uh, that uh, that's specific for agroecological farming. The knowledge at the federation level about influencing policies, but also the impact of agroecology. Um, we talked about how to finance this kind of research, how to strengthen the collaboration between farmers and researchers, and also how we want to collaborate, uh, not in a traditional way, but much more on an equality basis, and how we can empower farmers as researchers, and how we can contribute this, to this transformative uh, development in, 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 uh, in the Netherlands. We discussed the area-based approach and what kind of opportunities it would give for strengthening this collaboration also with other stakeholders. And we discussed the need for what, what I indicated uh, before, this, uh, these more regional and local demonstration and innovation farms, where we can link uh, demonstration research uh, but also exchange between farmers. And we discussed that we need to re really educate future professionals in a different way than we do now. Much more integral and much more uh, value-based instead of uh, how it is done in the, in, in, uh, at the moment. Next one, please. 
Um, so we also came up with an action agenda. Um, I would sh show now for two of these groups the action agenda. One from the knowledge uh, group is um, we are now trying to, to to initiate this institute for agroecology. We are having follow-up activities to strengthen this network of farmers and researchers to realize this future-proof education and to realize these regional demonstration farms. And for the policy group, there were also uh, some actions uh, identified. Um, so the first action was to um, to make contact with the ministry and FDO. This is one of the the the, the, the I call it the, the this is also says let's say part of the ministry, but it's responsible more for practical practical issues to make them aware of the challenges agriculture farms are facing. Uh, to start a campaign on access to land and short lease contracts to connect the different initiatives for commons um, and to see how we can really stimulate the solidarity economy and maybe also start an institute uh, around this uh, around this uh, topic. Next one, please. So and this is one of the follow-ups was a, a recent meeting uh, last week. We had a meeting between um, six agroecological farmers, representatives from the Federation, four researchers and seven policymakers to discuss the main challenges that were let's say, identified by the farmers and discussed during the previous two meetings. So this was a really nice meeting uh, on one of the agroecological farms. And it was really interesting that the, the policymakers were really open to, let's say, to listen to the, the, the challenges the farmers are facing. And they also tried to, let's say, um, to think uh, better farmers and uh, to find solutions to solve the challenges. Next one, please. So the topics that we discussed during this meeting last week uh, was to have, um, as, as, a, as a federation, to have more access to, the, to policy and to research. So now the idea is to have um, let's say a regular meeting between the Federation and the Ministry, maybe three or four times uh, a year to discuss all kinds of issues that are relevant for the agroecological farmers. We also discussed um, some of the performance indicators that are now implemented by the Ministry that not, do not match, let's say, the practices of agroecological farmers. We discussed the different types of systems to, to, to look at and to identify um, the quality and also the the impact of of the farming practices, uh, with uh, the particip participation of of citizens. We discussed this uh, this idea of these regional demonstration farms, um, and we discussed the initiation of, the, of this task force for agroecological uh, uh, research. So this is now all in the discussion with the ministry. So that's I think that's a really a way forward. A second group discussed about this access to land. So this was also now at least the, the ministry and RBO is now aware of all the problems that are, let's say, uh, that these agroecological farms are facing, and also the obstacles and regulations were discussed. So this will also have follow up in in, uh, in additional meetings. Next one, please. So the main result so far is that we have, I think, really realized now a, a much broader and, and, and strong network of agricultural farmers and the networks, NGOs and researchers, with concrete actions and follow-up meetings. We have started this uh, exchange with policymakers and made the, this, this movement of, uh, of agricultural farmers much more visible also to policymakers. And I think we have created a lot of enthusiasm among all the participants. Um, and I think the lesson from this is that, that we did not want to, to initiate a separate living lab or a separate activity, but just connect to the energy uh, of the Federation and link to their ambitions and see how we could support them um, in all their activities. Next one, please. Yes, and the next, uh, next activities that we plan, uh, we like to continue with this exchange with policymakers, uh, hopefully this will uh, this will be organized in a more regular way. 
We will also organize uh, some follow-up meetings with a, a broader group of farmers. We have also now linkages link already with the Federation of Agricultural Farmers. Follow-up meetings with also with the researchers and NGOs in these different uh, working groups. Um, and one of the options we also have this is to, to select one of the regions in the Netherlands to see if we can, can bring together also actors at a regional level to stimulate the transition to agroecology. Thank you. This is, uh, this is my last slide. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much for your presentation. So we can see that the Netherlands, the Dutch Living Lab is uh, on a further step uh, compared to the Italian and uh, UK Living Lab. But of course, we, we are having different uh, organization and yeah, it's on uh, a wider scale uh, due to, of course, the possibility in the Netherlands to do so. And are there questions or comments that you would like? Yeah, yeah there are no two questions yeah. in the chat, but you can, if you are able to do it on your own. Um, okay, yeah, I, have to I, I was tell, saying to the speaker, to the people. So okay. there is a question from Nikki and uh, Nikki Rose and a question also, uh, what is it, from Erika. It's nice if you can speak up. Erika, you so. can open the microphone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of you. Great, uh, very interesting living labs, I have to say. I have a question for Lindy from the living lab in UK. Uh, I would like to know until now, how many or how are, what do you consider, which are the most challenging part of having this living lab without them, like so structured? objective and these things that you said that it's not it's more like in this co-design process that you want to identify where are the key points and the key issues of the people in the living lab right so i would like to know how are the main challenges challenges that you are facing in terms of explain the project and connect with the people and also um, yeah also for how do you can oh, what are also the challenges uh, in terms of make this roadmap of the logic framework from the project when you don't have this structured way. So until now, what could be this challenge and what are your learning process until now? And yeah, I'm very interested to know this. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're, we are at a, an earlier stage, as we've said, from, um, from the other two living labs. So it was actually, it was really nice um, to hear what Jan said about what's going on in the Dutch Living Lab, because actually what they have done is they've kind of seen what the Federation is already doing and said, oh, how can we support, how can we partner and how can we grow that into a living lab? And I think in a way we're sort of taking that on a much smaller scale. So in this particular community we've identified, there is a researcher from who's not actually involved in this project, but she does a lot of community um, food work uh, locally in Coventry and she was the one who said well actually I have a connection with this group and this group and I'm a trustee on this group and, and it's it is essentially a, a particular area in the city a particular urban area that has got quite a lot of sort of social challenges health challenges and those sort of things but because of that there are already existing groups and networks so I'm hoping that as we go in what, you know, we have a we have a sort of broad object, objective with the project, but actually, if we go in and listen to what's already been done and where they perhaps had needs or where things couldn't be funded, but they'd have liked to do those things, how can we see if we can connect them up and and, and approach it that way? Does does that does that answer your question or not really? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, no, I can see this approach, and I think this actually the core of the living labs but my question is more how how easy it is to create this roadmap or when for example you want to identify what type of indicators are how to monitor the progress of the living lab and the process when you don't have the traditional structural way that uh, we want to do this and this is more like 
a little bit flexible, fle a little, yeah. no, a yeah. of flexibility in the process. So how do you can mind, uh, arrange the, the administrative part of monitoring or identifying mm -hmm. what type of things you have to monitor? And now that you mentioned also, if I can make another question is what type of key they said researchers or facilitators or what type of um, skills do you identify that are more important? I mean, maybe when you mentioned this uh, language of agroecology, uh, not only agroecology, maybe you can see now that maybe in these cases it's more important to start with sociology or with people with this or that skills and then you can go more into the technical details. So, yeah, this is an, another question apart. Yeah, so I think um, I think at the heart of our living lab, we want to it, we want it to sort of be birthed in community. So I think community would be a key word. So it, it's very local, and the people that we want to help are um, or we would would like to see benefit are those who there you know there there are potentially already certain structures in place. I mean, I think after we've done our first meeting, we will have a better idea of certain key things that we do want to see happen or you know that might be possible and um, so i mentioned this perhaps feeding into the food charter that this food charter has been written with so we may be able together to write a chapter into that food charter so that is a little bit more of a tangible um thing that, that could come out of it but i think the value that the um the stakeholders that we've identified will bring already is i think they'll already have certain established ideas of what they would like to do and what what might be possible and how you know and how we can kind of connect and support and it and it may be that we're by bringing because some of those people are connected already but perhaps like the health center for example hasn't been connected but if the health center could be connected in a way that they could refer people to community gardening or that they for people to have access to local food that normally could be quite expensive because of the way it's produced but actually there are ways to do it via the social supermarket that already exists but if we're able to connect those people together even from that perspective it might become clearer where we go next um, and i hope that as well we'll have them um, we'll have some support from the other two living labs to you know to feed in to say what well, you know actually what were the key things that you've decided to to look at and, and measure yourself against and and you know i think although they're very different from each other <laughs> like these three living labs are very different in terms of scale and in terms of sort of how they look i think there will be things that do overlap and we can learn from each other as well okay yeah thank you um i have many questions uh, the next one is from nikki rose uh, nikki if you are able to speak uh directly no you're not okay um anyhow sorry a message for everybody that are in the room but not on the stage uh, you need to um you need to uh, click on the top green button uh, next to the number how many people we are eh? because there are 13 inside but other seven outside the room so if you can click the green button, I then will allow you to enter into the into the real workshop, let's say that so that to habilitate you to speak and open your camera. Okay, anyhow, um, Nick, Nick question was, uh, what initiative are planned to connect with communities, not with single farmer or researcher, or even traveler? So let's say group of no communities. Who wants to answer? I can go quickly. I know you're probably bored of my voice, so I'll, I'll go. I'll go fast. Um, but I think for us, this shouldn't be too difficult to connect with some communities because I think the groundwork, like I said, is already there. The place that we are planning to meet is a community centre that already sees people come in, and it's actually the, the community centre is the location of the social supermarket so it's very much a community building it's recognized i think within its its community um so i whether um we have an opportunity to connect with travelers I, I we haven't thought about that but it's a good question 
Um, but but yeah, certainly in terms of community, we we hope those connections will be quite straightforward to do for us, um, and we are thinking about that. Thank you, Lindy. Then there was one one uh, point from uh, creation production, and then from Alexander Bedze. But I don't know if Cohen Warfor have an immediate uh, urgent issue. Yeah, well, no, no. I wanted to reply to what Lindy was explaining and to the question of uh, Erica. I think if I can read it right. Uh, my name is Kun de Voort, Network Builder at Inol and work package lead and already on capacity building. Uh, I wanted to refer quickly on uh, what you were saying, can we learn from each other? Yes, I sincerely hope so, eh? because otherwise you failed your living lab, simply. Uh, no, I wanted to point out that uh, within Enol, across any living agroecology uh, project which we have, we, we found it early last year, a working group on agriculture and agri-food. It's open to anyone. So uh, I'll put my email in the chat and please address me. This is led by Biosense from Serbia. Uh, it's a precision agriculture living lab and, and they are working on it uh, quite intensively to foster this knowledge exchange uh, between uh, uh, living labs on a, on, on a regional, national, international scale. Uh, also AAFC from Canada is involved in that group too, to get a global view. That was the first thing. Uh, related to what kind of researchers do you need? That will depend on the need of the stakeholders which you are identifying, which researchers you will need to add to the need because a living lab is demand driven. Eh? So, uh, uh, Lindy, you were referring to uh, it won't be too hard to, to collect the community because we have identified the stakeholders in, in our living lab. That's the first step. So that's that, that's very good. And now you have to start listening to them, not just asking them what you they think of what you thought of. It's the other way around. Eh? And based on their feedback, uh, they will provide you with research questions, probably in which then Erika, you can tap into sociology or agroecology specialists or, or whatever they, they need. Uh, well, that, that was my quick reflection. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, sorry. No, no, it's, uh, let's say, again, it's a round table, theoretically. <laughs> so anybody who wants to, let's say, to, in, to interfere with, with the other, it's totally fine. So thank you very much, Cohen, for you. Um, yeah, so there was, uh, the next question is um, co-creation products, but uh, no, they are not on the stage. So I read it. We are discussing discussing representation uh, in the agroecology network. So maybe Silvia wants to tell something about this. Silvia K. Uh, I don't know if you want to. I'm here. If, uh, yes. Yes. If can you, you hear want. me? Yes. Please, Silvia. Yeah. Well, um, it was rather spontaneous. I didn't prepare anything, but uh, thank you, Margit, for the invitation to share something and. Um, when I introduced myself as working for TNI and not being directly involved in any kind of living lab, it was only because I, I, I didn't realize that I had been a, a quote unquote stakeholder in a, in a living lab that events that Jan has uh, sketched out for us. But I think for me, that's a good sign because it, it shows that it's, you know, that um, and, it, and it's really a credit. I want to credit then Jan and Marquit for, for that uh, support work in particular, because um, yeah, it was done in a very organic way, connecting to where the energy is in, within the grassroots movements and the broader kind of movements around agroecology. And it wasn't presented in any kind of fulfilling any kind of project criteria way. So that's, um, I would say that's commendable to, to begin with. Um, but indeed, we've we've used this living, living lab as, a, as an opportunity to really um, push forward this, this uh, uh, aspiration that's existed amongst the Agroecological Farmers Federation, along with a number of support NGOs such as TNI, along with a number of researchers to really foreground agroecology in the Netherlands. It's Agroecology is not a word that's really used in the Netherlands um, much beyond a very select group of people. You know, we, we talk about permaculture or organic farming, or, or maybe people have heard of things like bio, biodynamic or nature inclusive, but that term agroecology is not in all and in all its ramifications is not well known yet. So that's what we really wanted to create with this agroecology network is a kind of convergence process um, that would raise not just the kind of um, opportunities that agroecology provides in terms of climate action and sustainability, but also can serve as a kind of convergence process for movements of various kinds 
and a kind of political consciousness raising um, also amongst farmers groups, you know, that, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of farmers that are interested in some of the techniques of agroecology, but by centering their voices in this kind of agroecology network, we can also um, hopefully build out a kind of broader movement and, and have this kind of political awareness raising around agroecology. So we've been, been discussing a bit also um, now that we have this, this movement behind creating this national agroecology network that came out of this initial network meeting in July and then this conference at Leiden University in October, what can such a, what should be the sort of governance structure of, of the network? And um, it's something that we very clearly didn't want to sort of institutionalize in a kind of uh, formal way. We, we actually thought that would sap energy, you know, if it's really another kind of um, formalized kind of structure in that way. But, but we talked more about, um, yeah, it will be a, a, a sort of more looser, looser network, which is very much um, builds on the energy that's that's come out from various kind of um, action groups based on those kind of thematic priorities that were identified, but which seeks this process of convergence where farmers are able to also um, discuss and share amongst themselves very practical issues that we're confronting. Like, for example, we have an agroecological farmer that's dealing with a kind of currently dealing with a slug plague on her farm, and she's wondering what kind of ducks, you know, would, are, can I use to, to deal with this um, slug invasion? And she, she finds that there isn't yet a good process of, of knowledge sharing and peer-to-peer and -peer learning amongst agroecological farmers in the Netherlands. So she wants to use the network in that way. But then there are others that, that you know, we want to obviously tackle that very practical concern of, of agroecological farmers. But we also want to use the network to, to yeah, to talk about issues around climate justice um, and, and social justice. So one of the also really nice things that came out of our movement building session at the Agroecology Conference is that we um, participated then in the Global Day of Action on November 6 for the, for the, around the COP26, around the, the, the yeah, the big kind of climate uh, day of action. And that there was a different kind of blocks in that march in Amsterdam and um, it was transformed. It was originally going to be just a farmer's block it was then transformed into an agroecology block, you know, to really um, wave the flag more for, for agroecology. So we identified certain strategic partners that we really want to connect the agroecology movement to, one being the, the climate justice and the nature conservation groups, um, because, yeah, there's a lot of still, I think, sometimes a bit sort of black and white thinking that um, farmers, you know, writ large are kind of... Um, blockers when it comes to sustainability or, or climate action so we want to build broader linkages there but we also want to foreground issues of of, of equity and inclusion and and a broader diversity of in you know of of what the kind of agroecology and, and food sovereignty movement is in the netherlands so also looking towards more um yeah diverse representation um working also with with some um urban gardeners um, of, of people of color in, in Amsterdam and other cities of the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, it, it's really a sort of um, unfolding process. I, 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 I don't know, we, we, we can't sort of say that we're, we're there, but certainly not there yet. But it's, um, this Living Lab has, has really provided an opportunity to, to have that step-by-step -step process that, that Jan was talking about. So yeah, just wanted to say a few more words about that. Thanks a lot, Silvia. Um, where is it? Ah, he disappeared again. And because Alex also have uh, the next question. Ah, just a moment. I'm trying to. He probably have some connection problem. I'm trying to put him again on the stage. Uh. No. Okay. Um, what do we do, Alex? Maybe we we wait for that you speak up. And so if there are also other comments uh, in the meantime, then we wait that Alex, uh, Alexander Beza, that is the coordinator of the project, go forward. OK. Um, yeah, there are any anybody else that want to contribute? Uh, again, this everybody are in, if you want to speak, you are totally, we are more than happy. If not, we can go on with the planned uh, presentations. 
Yep. So okay. I'll I'll add a comment and a question Please. if that's all right. Yeah. yeah. And I'm a current Lucy. I'm a current student of Alexander's, so here I go. <laughs> um in his absence. But I just want to thank all of the speakers for their presentations that were really rich um, and with some interesting overlapping themes. And to follow up a note that you made, Lindy, about the way that each of these um, living labs presented are, and sorry for the background noise, are sort of occurring at different scales, we could say, like the local versus the regional versus the national. Um, you sort of propose that perhaps it would be interesting to compare a bit what are the outcomes given these different scales. And so I wonder, you know, your initial thoughts on, on kind of doing that type of comparison, if it's something that there's room for in the project, maybe that's also a question for Alexander and Paola. Um, but that's a curiosity and yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. And, and, okay, and then my other question, um, has to do a bit with like the structure of this living lab um, methodology, I guess we could say. Yesterday here in Barcelona at the forum, there was a researcher from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, and she presented on some research using the living lab methodology. And she referred to these different um, innovation lab types, the contract and the policy. And so the contract innovation labs are the more local scale farmers. Um, and then the policy innovation lab is like the policy makers. And then the role of the research is to sort of connect the needs um, of the CILs with the potential, you know, enabling policies at the, PIL level. So I'm curious if this methodology is something that you're aware of or interested in and in, in using in your work. And um, those are my questions. Thank you. Yeah. I, sorry. Yeah. Lindy, right. sorry. Yeah. Um, no, it, that sounds really interesting, Lucy. I, I would have liked to have been in that one because um, I think that that could have been really helpful or and could still be really helpful as, as we design at sort of different levels because I don't think we necessarily, before we plan the project, thought about having the different levels. It's kind of almost naturally come about, but we do think it's actually quite a valuable thing. Um, but in terms of comparing and contrasting, I think that will be probably more Elise and Paula who, who do that role because they're leading that project we're, we're we're doing the um sort of a, in our little not entirely in a bubble but you know my focus will be more on our living lab in the uk and um, and of course learning from the netherlands and and learning from italy as well but, but i think the overall comparison will probably be done more um, at the project level but yeah if you want to send us any notes about that other the the uh, <laughs> the one that you went to that sounded really good or if there's a recording that 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 could be really useful for us. Sure, I I, I do have an audio recording. I'll just have to ask the presenter first if she would be okay with that. And I took notes and have her email anyway. So I'm curious to see more about this method. She proposed it as a living labs methodology. So I'd be happy to to share that. I'll put her email in the chat at least now, so you know who she is. And anyhow, all the presentation we are collecting uh, from the different workshop. So we, I hope that we will be able to share it uh, in the website of Agroecology Europe soon. I, I can't tell you tomorrow, maybe, but let's say as soon as possible. Okay, Alexander. In the meantime, is, uh, again, this uh, let's say disappear from the. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, Jan, uh, okay, he wrote the, the, the question, so I read for Alex. Jan, so many topics now listed after three workshops, which to go for in the next months or on a longer perspective of the Living Lab? So how do you select? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, again, we like to, to, to take, let's say, the ambitions of the Federation as a starting point. Um, and, and I think for the short term, for them, it's really important to make a good connection with the ministry because they seek very concrete obstacles that agroecological farmers are facing and, and they are also facing themselves. Um, so, and I think the ministry plays a crucial role in, let's say, 
changing regulations, uh, changing also uh, subsidies for farmers. So to to get it, to to have this kind of um, more mutual understanding and, and and trust between the federation and the people from industry that are also influencing these kind of regulations and policies, I think that that's an important uh, line. Um, at the same time, this this what also Sylvie was mentioning this this broadening this movement with also the NGOs that are let's say more addressing cl climate issues and environmental issues is another important topic. But that maybe that's less relevant for agroecology for for AU uh, for our project. But I think it's it's we try to to link the different. Um, um there's let's say different ambitions um from the from the federation and see what we can extract extract when when we talk about innovation and 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 and, and research and uh, how to let's say bring this agro ecological let's say the implementation of agroecological principles in the Netherlands to next to the next step so we cannot say yet what what can be what we will be exactly our next activity it that's something that is let's say this that's now kind of under discussion and exchange with uh, with all the stakeholders that are now involved in this in this let's say also evolving uh, network of a bit of the different stakeholders but the other kind of core group with which we let's say at least share our ideas and discuss uh, next the uh, next steps so who's running the show then Jan? There's at least one host organization of your living lab, I guess. Yeah, well, I think the federation. They are, let's say, in, let's say they are the maybe in the. They should be. I think they are the leading organization. Yeah. Okay. So they're paying the bills. They're paying the bills. Uh, what kind of bills? Yeah. If a, a bill is sent to your living lab, someone needs so, to pay it. Sorry. If a bill is sent to your living lab someone needs to pay it somehow uh, a living lab is more than the, the the living lab project which you are running here in in in, in ae for eu huh? uh, and you are at the beginning so it's, it's totally yes. fine most living labs are founded via a project uh, so don't get scared yes. but uh, i did like the question from alexander what's the longer perspective uh, so the living lab has three layers actually uh, very briefly i don't dive into you have the macro level which is the organizational process platform level with the parties running the show. That's why I asked. Eh? And then you plug in an AE for EU living lab project in which you want to achieve specific goals. And your workshops were related to the meso level, listening to your story. And then the micro level are the tools, the methods, the, the everything which you do from research or a co-creation perspective to, 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 to make this thing happen. And, and it's in constant flux. The one is constantly influencing the other. So the longer perspective of the living lab. Uh, uh, well, when we teach people how to set up a living lab, we, yeah, and we, we are not teaching the Bible because Ines Gutierrez is a, a very good equal. So I, I put the thumb up and she knows what, what she is doing, for instance, and Lucy. Um, you need to come with a problem statement of your living lab first. Which problem are you trying to solve? And then fix which needs to be involved and that you did. And then you started listening to the stakeholders. And did you ask them to prioritize? Yeah, so I think, think, yes. Because I think I... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I think I think the, the main the main um, topic where we find each other is that we really want to um, accelerate this transition to agroecology because then we think this is really crucial in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And we also aware that a lot of people are now starting to use agroecology uh, without, let's say, um, knowing that they are. No, but also loss, <laughs> just using it in a very technical way, hmm. not yeah. critical to let's say the current current agricultural and food system, and all the different let's say uh, the way it is organized in the Netherlands. Hmm. So, and I think there is an interest from different NGOs because they link it to their, their climate agenda or to different agendas. There's an interest from researchers because they are really motivated to align with the obstacles these ecological farms are facing. Mm -hmm. I think with also policymakers are now realizing 
that's also for them is really interesting because they want to, let's say, make this move and this transition, but they don't know how. So they get a lot of opposition from conventional farmers. And here they have a group of farmers that are really committed to make this uh, transition. And these farmers indicate we are not supported by you. So they also have an, an interest now to, to connect to all these activities. So now I think we have to find a way to bring us all together. Um, but I think that's, that's, what's, what is com that, that's what is happening now. Yeah. We find a kind of a, a common ground. And I think these, this, let's say this structure of having these reg regular meetings between the different stakeholders, having these regional uh, demonstration centers and innovation centers, that could be the, ve the vehicles and also a kind of um, mechanism for financial support for these types of farmers and also change, changes in regulations for conventional farms that do not fit these, let's say, uh, front runners. Mm -hmm. I think these are the main issues that we are addressing, the, the, I think, the coming years. And this will not be solved in one year. This will be a long-term process. Indeed. Sorry, I have a, a question. Can I? Yeah, regarding to Jan's comment, uh, I was wondering if in this learn that is the learning process, right? So we are now in this learning process. Do you find some pressure or yeah, let's say pressure from the funders or for some institutional levels to accelerate this process or maybe that can limit at this? flexibility in this learning process how did you find this part of maybe it's a contradiction or not this learning process linked to project structural projects funders and how you can handle these things i mean first is if you find this contradiction of these problems and then the second is how to if you have it or if you find this how to go through this until now um but maybe the only funder is this is this project so I don't, I don't feel the pressure now. Um, so I, I, what we try to do, and I think this is, I hope it is appreciated that we, um, because, uh, because when we, I think when, when this project was stru structured, we were just thinking about living labs in a very systematic way and looking at the obstacles, then implementation and then the dissemination. And then we realized that for our country, this would not work in this way. Um, so we were, without having a lot of discussions, we, we, we decided to do it in a much, much more informal way, maybe less structured way, but to link, uh, to, ma to make use of the energy that was uh, among different stakeholders. Um, so maybe our challenge would be to, to learn from our, um, from our living lab and also do some monitoring to see what what different stakeholders are learning, um, so I think this is something to maybe to discuss, um, and I think also Sylvia's remark was quite <laughs> important that she re didn't realize she was one of the stakeholders in the living lab. Uh, but at the same time, I think we have mentioned this that it was it was a living lab, but it was not realized by stakeholders that this was also part of this project. And so that's I think that's also interesting. I see this as a very positive thing. You should never tell people that they are on a living lab because then you have to start explaining what it is. And yeah, 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 yeah. Years, they are part of an initiative to to solve a thing. But maybe the challenge because a lot of the stakeholders they are they want to have action, and we also want to learn from this. So that that can be, that can be a challenge between these two. Two different ambitions. Yeah, well, I, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm going to keep jumping in. Uh, um, it, it's my passion. Sorry. Uh, uh, listening to your stakeholders, it, it's it's massively important to to your living effort. Somehow, you will have to give them a roadmap, a guided roadmap. Otherwise, you will go in so many different directions. Uh, uh, the most successful living labs are the ones which are within the whole creative act open ecosystem somehow are able to create focus anyway so uh, when the when the government that's why you need the three levels otherwise you are only just doing a lot of really nice crazy stuff but it doesn't go anywhere in the long run 
and that's where the governance level comes in. Um, uh, when you say the only funder is now the project, uh, then I think you have still two years to find a sustainable model. <laughs> because if you would apply tomorrow to our network of living labs, you would be refused because you're a project, you're not a living lab. Uh, in that stage, listening to your story. Uh, but uh, again, don't don't worry. Most living labs are founded via funded projects. So, uh, so if you want to do this in the long run and, and listen to your story and the Sylvia story and, and and so on, that's clearly the intention. You should think about the long perspective as of now, while listening to your stakeholders, and they will pull you in very different directions. And you will soon learn, if you didn't already, that the farmers have an all different goal in that direction while the municipality maybe wants to go into it and that's the tricky thing but also the very valuable thing of a living lab and the more local a living lab gets the more practical it is to organize uh, linking to what uh, alice and, and mm. Andy were telling earlier. yeah okay thank you there was uh also a question to from to Nikki and then maybe and then we go on Alicia with the now presentation of the other living lab uh, Nikki um, I read because she's not in in the stage regarding what problem are you trying to solve there are uh, are you working with doctors or toxicologists to address the health impacts of conventional agriculture Maybe, I don't know, Jan or Lindy, I don't know. Yeah, at the moment, no. Um, however, we, I think um, I mentioned just very briefly in the presentation, we have become aware of a brand new health centre that has come into this local area where we'd like to start our living lab. So we would very much love to have them as one of the stakeholders and, and invite them to be part of what we're doing. Um, whether it goes as um, kind of strictly working with doctors and toxicologists, it may not be quite at that level, but it may be, you know, we what foods can we encourage local, you know, what, what are the sort of needs of local people health-wise who are coming to see you as a GP? You know, how can we bring in healthier foods to those people? How can we connect them with healthy diets and children with obesity locally or you know whatever it might be or what um opportunities are there to do some sort of local gardening and um, for mental health you know those sorts of care care side of things so i think on a perhaps not such a grand level as working with the toxicologist and really like drumming down to what's in our food but, but potentially working with again a local stakeholder um, who's interested in health we think we'd really like to get them on board if we can Yeah, very quickly in our case in Valvaraita, no, not yet. Uh, also because we are in a very rural uh, mountain area, or anyhow, there is not. Uh, we we have the opposite prop, not problem. Let's say it's not a problem, but um, there is not big uh, sign of intensive agriculture. Mm, we go how ciao Cohen. thank you. Uh, Alice, you want to call for the next? Yes. yes, so we can start with the next two presentation of Living Labs. And uh, the two Living Labs uh, were mapped by Agroecology for Europe project. And uh, we have uh, we can start with uh, Metro, Mertola Future Lab in Portugal. And I will share my screen uh, if, you, uh, if it's okay. So I leave le the floor to Rosinda after I share the screen. Okay, I think you can see the screen. Yes. <clears throat> Are you listening? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity sh to share um, this process. Uh, we initially didn't thought uh, at this process as a living lab, but um, uh, the amount of experiences that we are taking place 
gives us this kind of um, um, environment to that. So Mertola uh, Laboratory for the Future is, can you put the, the next, uh, um, is a response to um, the main challenges of our territory. We are placed at the south of uh, Portugal in a, an interior area near the border to Spain. Um, and we are a very rural municipality. And we have three main um, uh, problems or challenges. We have a very low population density and uh, a menace of human, uh, human desertification. We have an area of 1,292 kilometers per square and only 6,205 inhabitants. We have 106 villages and a population density of 4.8 inhabitants per kilometer square. And 35% uh, of these inhabitants or residents are over 65 years old. So also a very elderly population. Um, regarding our landscape and climb, um, we have a very high vulnerability to de desertification. We have very poor soils um, and all of that gathering with a semi-arid climate we are very vulnerable to climate change and also to extreme weather uh, events. Next, please. But we are so uh, have a lot of um, uh, positive aspects. Uh, we are a natural park uh, with very um, with a lot of biodiversity. Uh, the landscape, it's a, a, a mosaic. We have a, a different kinds of landscape. We are a heritage um, a place. We are applying now to the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, we have a lot of research, scientific research uh, uh, connected with archaeological research. and. We have a lot of uh, social capital. We are a very resilient community and territory, and we tend to work together to solve our problems. Next, please. So resilient is our main or middle name, you would say. Next, please. So um, Facing all those challenges, we decided to respond. And so this laboratory, it's uh, a response from this resilient community that believes in a more sustainable uh, future. Next, please. This laboratory uh, is um, working in different areas. Uh, we are working in the agroecological to an agroecological transition. So we have a local uh, agenda for agroecology. Uh, we are also working in the areas of education, training, and literacy. We want to present ourselves and test uh, educational solutions adapted to very low density territories. Uh, we are also working on a social and territory cohesion so that we can um, address things like landscape management, urbanism, housing, connecting, uh, mobility and the quality of life. Culture and heritage, it's another area. We understand that culture is a factor of social and um, territorial cohesion. And so we want to make um, culture accessible to everyone. We are also working in the areas of the new rural economy, um, working things like circular economy, transition, and the relationships or interface between rural and urban areas. And finally, we are working the govern governance model because we understand that if you want to uh, go for a more sustainable 
um, uh, community, we need to change our uh, governance model. Next, please. So I will talk more about our agroecology uh, um, agenda and um, the this uh, agenda uh, addresses not only um, the agriculture itself but also the restoration or regeneration of our ecosystems and also a better uh, adaptation to climate change and desertification. Next, please. So I am talking, I am telling you about the path that we uh, are taking. And so the first is to uh, change and uh, our governance model to a more collaborative and creative uh, uh, leadership. And so since 2018, we have regular sessions with the community, with different stakeholders to discuss and to look for um, uh, solutions together. We have co-creation sessions. Uh, we are participating in training programs for a more transformational, transformational leadership. Uh, we have peer communities and peer le learning. We are presented, we are uh, at different networks and we also develop a lot of conferences and seminars in our community in order to cap capacitate the stakeholders for this new model of governance. Next, please. These are some of the networks we are in. Um, and, and the food network is a European network um, of uh, local food systems. The agro Ecology Caravan is a national products, uh, uh, project. Uh, the Rebundance, uh, it's also uh, uh, an international uh, project, but with uh, a national uh, representative. And we are also part of the Ubuntu Academy um, project. Next, please. Also, another area we are working in it's uh, the area of formal and non-formal education. So we are uh, addressing all uh, um, our communities, starting with the schools. In our primary schools, we have uh, gardens, uh, syntropic gardens, because we are not only uh, teaching uh, children how to produce uh, food, but also uh, how to regenerate the soil and how to create agroforests. Also at the schools, we have cooking lessons for children. And also this cooking academy addresses the parents and also the restaurants. And we have different education activities uh, with children um, regarding, for instance, food waste and also uh, how to incorporate local traditional food in their diets. Next, please. These are some of the images of the sessions we have with the children and some parents also. Next, please. Also some uh, pictures from the activities with the children. Next, please. Also, we work with the community empowering the community to have um, more knowledge about um, uh, food and sustainability and also about responsible uh, and ecological consumption and uh, in order to empower our community to have an, uh, better uh, decisions. This is one of the activities we, we develop um, in order to be more close to the people, we uh, have sessions one, one time per, per month in our two uh, municipality markets. Uh, and at these sessions, we talk about food, some kind of uh, theme. Um, we invite specialists to talk about that specific theme. Uh, we cook um, for the people and also the people share and bring things from their home. Um, and so, and then we discuss and talk about the theme uh, 
uh, and uh, all of the food that we share needs to be local um, from the season and we, we normally um, tell people to bring to reduce their consumption of uh, meat and to bring foods that are not related with uh, meat. Here are some of the images of those sessions. Next, please. Um, another project regarding community empowerment is this one, the therapeutic, therapeutic gardens. Um, it's a project to give uh, awareness to regenerative practices. Um, let's, the idea is for people to look at their own gardens and their own villages and transform their, their way of, of working. Um, first, we want to give uh, awareness and visibility to the people that already are doing that in their own, in their own homes. Um, in order to um, evaluate what they are doing. And also then one of the actions of this project is that we, we are going to build a, a garden in the community, a community garden uh, with these regenerative practices in order for people then to apply them in their own uh, private uh, gardens. Next, please. These are some of the people in their own gardens. The first part of this, of this project is to give uh, visibility to, to people and let them show their gardens to the community. So we are uh, promoting this on our websites and our social media uh, um, pages in order for the entire community to know um, the gardens of all these citizens that are participating in the projects. Next, please. Uh, in terms of formal and non-formal education, we are also working at professional training, uh, aiming mainly farmers in courses, seminars, uh, communities of practice. We visit international and national projects that apply um, regenerative uh, practices. Uh, we promote visits between mar farmers in Mertola so that everyone knows what everyone is doing. Um, and the idea is also to visit projects that are applying already regenerative farming practices such as key line system, holistic grazing, syntropic farming and others. Next, please. We also have a professional school um, that work, works with young people and the areas that they are exploring is landscape management, sustainable hunting management, because we are in a very hunting uh, area, nature conservation, sustainable tourism, programs for food evolution, uh, local food systems, and also uh, uh, they are also involved in the Ubuntu Academy that is um, more directed to uh, forming um, the new leaders of tomorrow. Next, please. Uh, we also have um, Agroecology Center, an experimental center where we um, that is aiming to the production, demonstration, and mar monitoring of different uh, regenerative farming techniques. Um, and so we are already uh, putting these techniques in practice and monitoring them. Uh, and this research and experimental center is connected with some scientific and, uh, um, area, um, institutions and universities that are monitoring the, the results that we are accomplishing there. And also we uh, provide uh, training programs for people that want to uh, visit the center. Next, please. These are some of the images of the, the, um, the center and some of the groups that visit and training courses that we develop there. Next, please. Uh, we have a voluntary program for people who want to work in the in our farm, in our gardens, and in the agroecology center. And these are some of the volunteers that have already co come and spend time with us. 
uh, since the voluntary program started in 2019 and we had already over 100 volunteers here in Mertola, even with the COVID situation. Next, please. Um, the buildings that you are seeing in that uh, picture, uh, they are going to be um, uh, an investigation center that is going to be specialized in biodiversity, agroecology and wild resources management. And it's uh, a research center uh, that we are going to develop in, in a partnership with the University of Oporto here in, in Portugal and with the CBU, which is a, a, an investigation center specialized in the areas of the biodiversity. Next, please. These are some of the uh, uh, images of the uh, center. We already have the laboratories in another building, but we are going to renewal this old building in uh, Martela um, to accommodate this investigation uh, center. Next, please. Um, this is another part of our uh, living lab, more now focused in the production. Um, we are developing a local food system and uh, we have uh, already some uh, regenerative uh, gardens. I have to say that Mertula is not uh, a place um, very um, with many gardens because uh, we don't have water and the soils are very poor. So we are experiencing um, and these new techniques in order to produce food with less water. Uh, using these new uh, regenerative uh, um, practices um, and also when we started this network of gardens we also um, decided that we need to, cut, to articulate the production between the farmers in order to um, um, overcome the problems that we have regarding the soils being so poor and also the lack of water. Right now, we already have producing uh, local food um, five uh, gardens. Um, three of these gardens are uh, social gardens. But they are related with social institutions. Uh, we also have uh, uh, urban gardens that are of private peoples, that they are not farmers, they are people from the village that have a space that the municipality gave, gave them. Um, and some of the, the producers and the gardens are related also with restaurants or with social canteens. Next, please. We also have a, 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 a land exchange program. Um, uh, we experimented this program so we open. We had an open call uh, for people that would like to come to Martela to work in our in our gardens, and we had um, uh, people that own lands that were uh, uh, available to give their lands for people to explore as a garden, uh, with the condition that they would have to produce food for the local uh, food system. We had our first program had three volunteers um, and they are already uh, developing their farmers. They are at the second phase. They are testing uh, their autonomous learning with tutoring at the Center of Agroecology. And the third phase is that they are going to now develop their projects in lands that were um, given by land, local uh, own land of lands. Next, please. In terms of uh, how to get this to the, 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 the local uh, consumers, we have local markets. Uh, the two municipality local markets are now selling the products from these gardens. Next, please. We have uh, baskets that are delivered uh, to people that order them on an on, uh, online uh, platform. Next, please. 
And we also are delivering at social and school canteens. Next, please. And we have local producer markets, and I already mentioned a web platform. Next, please. There is a multiplier effect. Uh, now there are several uh, uh, projects regarding with food and uh, with um, regenerative practices. Um, other institution, private people, restaurants, are incorporating all these concepts of local season, uh, seasonal and regenerative food. And so the project has grown and had a multiplier defect in the community. Next, please. So these are our main current challenges. Um, we, we really need to improve our um, governance model. Um, COVID uh, brought us apart and we need to rebuild the confidence that we had before COVID um, and also to gain the same uh, uh, rhythm of meetings and working together as had, we had before. Um, also, we now have a lot of people who want to come to Martula and participate in the projects and it's difficult to give response to all of the people that want to collaborate with us because we are so few. And also we need um, a lot of, we are in need of some infrastructures that are um, necessary to, to the project, especially agroecologist, uh, uh, agro logistic uh, infra infrastructures. Uh, and we, are, we have some times difficulty to find fundings because our project is not a very um, uh, institutional uh, project. Uh, it's not one institution, it's several institutions. There is not one leadership. I, for instance, I represent the municipality of Martela, but this uh, laboratory or this process is a community process. And the programs that finance this are normally very standard and they don't respond to, respond to our um, needs. Next, please. That's it. Thank you so much uh, for your time and sorry for the long presentation and sorry for my English. <laughs> no, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, it was uh, really, really impressive. I'm, I'm, I'm very, yeah, really impressed. I don't have other words. <laughs> but anyhow, um, yes, let's say we, we, we would be even, yeah, I'm more curious to, to learn more about it. So. I hope I can visit you soon. <laughs> yeah, anyhow, okay, so... Um, yes, we yeah, can I, go for the I, last presentation before, like, thank you very much, Rosinda. And sorry, I didn't ask you to present yourself that you were not with us at the beginning. Maybe if you agree, you can do after the presentation of Matteo, since we're running a bit, like, long. And if you can stay, if not, you can say two words about, yeah, your role in the project and... I, I am a councillor mm -hmm. in the municipality um, uh, and uh, I am one of the members of this uh, partnership, I would say. We, we intend to, see, to uh, look at this process as almost as a, a living being because it grows um, more or less uh, according to the needs of the process. Um, so I represent a group of institutions, of people, um, so there is not a leadership in, in the, the project. Each one is doing their own part, but we are all, all um, we all know what um, we want. And so, uh, and we check up with us, we have regular meetings for that, but my role is to facilitate because being a, a municipality, we are close to government, we are close to uh, regional institutions, um, and our main role here is, is to facilitate uh, the process and, of course, funding some, some of it. Uh, 
um, and also uh, uh, since we are uh, very close to people, also to um, a kind of uh, um, it's like we translate all these concepts to the people uh, and also make mediate the relationship between some stakeholders and the local uh, community because people normally trust the municipality so it's also our our role to make all of this a very close and confident process for everyone Thank you very much. And yeah, I now leave the floor to Matteo so to present the uh, Rete Semi Rurali. And then I think you can share the screen as you ask me. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, yes, uh, my name is uh, Matteo Petitti. I work with Rete Semi Rurali, uh, which is a uh, the Italian uh, Rural Seed Network, and uh, we were uh, mapped by Agroecology for Europe as a living lab. So as uh, Cohen said earlier, don't tell the living labs that they are living labs. So we, we, did, we didn't know we were one until we were mapped really. Um, we are a network of, uh, of um, other organizations, Italian organization, involved with uh, biodiversity, biodiversity conservation, management, agroecology, um, some are, are uh, no NGO, like we, like, uh, we are also an NGO. We also have uh, um, an organic seed company, uh, cooperative of uh, farmers producing organic um, pasta and, uh, and other products from cereals. We have some uh, solidar economy districts, uh, seed saving organizations, so it's quite diverse. And uh, everything revolves about uh, cultivated biodiversity, so seed diversity. And uh, we uh, operate through several dimensions of, uh, of agricultural biodiversity, starting from, this, from the seed, uh, going up to um, researching, biodiversity and uh, working with the uh, community and stakeholders trying to uh, bring about at the end a paradigm shift in the uh, um, socio-economical and legal framework that that at the end of the day uh, determines how much room for expansion we have for for uh, uh, seed diversity in um, our um, context we are based in uh, Tuscany, in um, just uh, outside Florence, in Scandici, and uh, we, uh, since uh, 2019, we moved into a new um, facility. It was a small supermarket, which was abandoned for several years, and thanks to the municipality, we were able to uh, uh, access this uh, space and um, renovate it. So we have an office space, we have a training space also available to our members for meetings or, uh, um, or um, other, other activities with the community. And uh, we uh, recently established a, a library uh, specialized in uh, agrobiodiversity. So uh, it's, uh, it holds a collection of um, of books, booklets, uh, magazines, and uh, everything is um, catalogued and uh, in the um, city library system, so it can be searched through the um, through the uh, centralized uh, online library catalog, and then uh, anyone interested can request to uh, consult this this material and uh, and visit us. So this will officially be launched next Tuesday. Um, we also have a, a community seed bank in our, in our uh, headquarters where we uh, process, store, and then uh, uh, distribute um, seeds, and mainly cereal seeds. We've, we've been working for uh, more than 10 years on uh, cereals, so mainly wheat, uh, but also um, um, maize, and then more recently, uh, we um, 
we we started working with rice in uh, northern Italy, in Lombardy and Piedmont, where we are establishing a, a, also a community seed bank, and um, and also with other crops such as sunflower, tomato, oats, etc. So the, the the range and the variety of our work is expanding. Um, at community level in our uh, area, we also we um, uh, started a project with the uh, urban gardens with the uh, region of Tuscany and the, and the municipality of Scandici, where we now we have 29 allotments. And we set up this project trying to promote uh, biodiversity in these vegetable gardens also, um, and create a community of gardens through uh, training and other, um, and other uh, socializing events to uh, to um, bring about a um, collaborative and uh, uh, inclusive environment, also open to the other uh, citizens in the, um, in the area. So th this area was quite rural until not many years ago. And then it's uh, during the, um, the economic boom in Italy, it became quickly urbanized, but there are still many links with with uh, with the more rural surroundings of the hills, where in the at the edge of the plain of the of the Arno city, uh, Arno Valley, <clears throat> we um, our work is uh, organized uh, under let's say four main pillars. Um, the uh, at the base of everything we have seeds, so to uh, to um, conserve, to manage, and to uh, make available this seed. We, um, we work with community seed banks, so not only our own community seed bank, but also uh, uh, community seed banks from our um, members. And, and, um, and we, we promote the creation of new community seed banks. Um, then there is an important part of our work, which is uh, which is uh, researching biodiversity, and um, and uh, we um, refer to this as action research because it's actually not just researching and observing, but um, through the research trying to trying to bring about a change and address address the needs of the stakeholders involved. And then an uh, important part, of course, is all the work with the community, which regards working with our, with our member association, but also many farmers and other stakeholders of uh, value chains and citizens who in, um, we encounter in our, in our activities, in our field days and workshops. And finally, an uh, important part of our work relates to policy which uh, in Italian we call it, we call it sowing the change because the word policy in Italian doesn't translate very well. And uh, it's actually has maybe a bad reputation at the moment because politicians are not very popular. Um, and uh, it's, this relates to, to uh, um, an advocacy work which uh, we do with the uh, Italian and European um, authorities and, uh, and officials uh, uh, who are involved in uh, seed certification and um, uh, seed regulation and, uh, and several aspects that, that are linked to uh, uh, access to plant genetic resources. Um, I'll try to give you a couple of practical examples and then maybe we can discuss um, you, you may have some questions. Um, so with relation to community seed banks, uh, at the beginning of our work was focused on collecting, on, the, on conserving, but then it's, um, it um, quickly became important, uh, uh, evident importance of uh, making available this material, distributing, um, also giving advice on how to, um, and support farmers on how to to uh, save their own seed and uh, and produce quality seed of uh, local varieties and population and and also from uh, 
initially working exclusively with local varieties varieties we now work a lot with crop populations which uh, um, can are a very powerful way to uh, boost biodiversity in in agriculture and uh, we have um, we collaborate with a farm in Tuscany where we have a, a um, what we call a field catalog where um, several hundreds plots of different uh, varieties and populations that we multiply each year to uh, study, observe, but also just to, uh, to uh, rejuvenate the seed, which is then made available through our uh, Campagna di Semina, our uh, sowing campaign. We have one in autumn just closed and one in spring for um, spring crops. Um, so anyone can request the seed and uh, we'll will uh, will receive will will get the seed posted um, with a with a, an, um, a standard um, a simplified standard material transfer agreement under the uh, umbrella of the uh, FAO plant treaty and uh, if you uh, like to see more there is a video that we made in within the live seed project uh, available on uh, on youtube and you, you can check the link maybe later. Um, then moving on to to action research, as I as I mentioned earlier, but I'm sure you're very, all very familiar with with it. Um, the idea of action research is not just to do research per se, but to uh, have an impact in the in the context in the environment where the uh, the researchers operate and uh, and uh, um, identify the research objectives in a participatory way with the stakeholders and also very important to uh, give back the to bring back the results to the stakeholders and uh, go through a critical reflection phase to inform the future strategic planning and, and the search objective. So this is, uh, in practice, happens with a multi-actor and trans transdisciplinary approach. We have been involved in several European research projects, but also um, rural development projects at regional levels, national projects. And uh, we um, adopt a participatory a range of participatory methodology especially um, with relation to participatory selection and evaluation of, um, of uh, plant material. So one practical, practical example, which uh, then has also other impacts at community and uh, policy level was, for instance, the introduction in our network of uh, evolutionary bread wheat population which um, came from uh, from Syria, from Icarda during um, uh, the Solivam research project and and uh, became then available a certified seed thanks to a European temporary experiment. So the first time that non-uniform seed could be legally marketed. And um, this on, on, one, on one side was uh, part of the work was to uh, enable this uh, this seed system to to happen, and the, on the other, to to uh, study how this population evolved in different environments, especially in relation to climate change, uh, leading to uh, publication um, that you um, you can find um, easily online, or um, you can write to me if you're interested. Um, and this work had some impact also at the European um, level, as we would see. Um, then, with relation to community, uh, we, we, our, our motto is that uh, each, to each seed its land and to each land its seed. And this leads to, uh, to seed system because for each seed and each context uh, an appropriate seed system is um, is needed and studying seed system is something that we do a lot with the community 
products we work with that um, that that uh, hold and uh, use seed diversity of local varieties or populations and uh, um, this is one of the aspects that we we often um, use as a methodology in our uh, workshops and meetings with uh, stakeholders and then um, another important aspect with working with our community of um, farmers and stakeholders and members relates to value chain because of course one thing is preserving and uh, maintaining biodiversity another is uh, uh, bringing it into fruition and to uh, becoming a um, also sustainable from an economic point of view. So we've um, been working on developing, for instance, a, a, a seed label for this uh, um, bread wheat evolutionary population, which uh, uh, has already reached the market in, in the form of flour and also certified seed through uh, several value chains. And this particular case, this was done with a with a regional project in Tuscany on uh, on uh, population seed systems involving uh, farmers, millers, and transformers. So the the whole value chain. And finally, relating to paradigm shift and uh, policy, uh, our work is. Uh, operates on two main uh, pillars. One is uh, uh, with connected to uh, the policy environment relating to seed marketing laws. And uh, as we're in the European Union, everything derives from a European directive. So um, again, connecting to, uh, to our work with the, uh, with the bread wheat population, um, this, this uh, work, help to uh, model appropriate formal seed system that produce certified seed for uh, these uh, populations. And uh, now that this temporary experiment is finished and we're entering soon into the new organic regulation, um, this experience helped to inform the commission to uh, draft delegated acts um, for this, the new organic regulation where, where population for all crops will be um, available as organic heterogeneous material. And the second aspect relates to um, plant genetic resources. In particular, we, uh, we promote the, um, the FAO uh, plant treaty and uh, especially article six for sustainable use and article nine on farmers' rights, and we do this through uh, training and workshops and uh, promoting the, um, the use of uh, material transfer agreement for uh, exchange of seeds so that farmers and other stakeholders are uh, operate within uh, this framework and uh, are also in, in a way secure from uh, potential uh, complications of, uh, of uh, starting perhaps a value chain from something that they, they receive, but there's no uh, paper trail behind. Um, I think I'll stop here and um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's also a very interesting project with a lot of research going on, but also interaction with farmers. So it's a very living lab. But it, it's interesting, I think, that through the project, um, these uh, real life projects are knowing themselves as living labs. So this term is getting to, into real life and not only staying in the university or on a theoretical level. So. And it's, I, I'm very happy to hear uh, your two projects, uh, also to get more into the um, real happening of what a living lab can be, because still our projects, our living lab from Agroecology for Europe are in a very like starting process. So it's not getting really like a, 
a great uh, yeah a, a situation of uh, interaction yet and so yeah if there are some questions i see that few people are here in the main stage but still 16 people are um, yeah on the in the room so maybe you can, i see yeah. any Sorry. I just want to say that maybe there could be also a connection because, of course, as let's say we uh, at, at UNIS get together, we have the House of Biodiversity for the Piedmont serial no, in connection with the city semi rurali, and could also be that uh, we use, uh, let's say, we we now we use, we will uh, collaborate with the Living Lab in Valvaraita maybe for developing also some field there in serial. There is a, there is already an interest. So in, instead, I think it seriously could be one of the focus of that living lab too no, that's great yeah also maybe it can be a place of uh, experimental experimental field uh, the in the mountain maybe if uh, i don't know if already semi rally in this moment is looking for new fields of experimentation or i think it's a very great idea from paola to increase this collaboration among the, the university, Rete Semiru Rurali, and also the European project. Oh, we're, we're very happy to collaborate. We're, um, we're getting into RAI as well, so this is... Yeah, exactly. Um, I also was thinking yeah. about RAI. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think it's important that... Uh, um, that seed diversity and uh, the recognizing the importance of appropriate uh, cultivars for agroecology is, you know, has a kind of a recognition within, within, um, say, the agroecology world and in in, live, in living labs, because it's seed and seed system is often overlooked uh, by. Um, you know, by say many agricultural scientists, at least when I was when I was a student, you didn't hear a lot about seed. You know how it was produced and all the complexities behind it, with from plant breeding to the say legal framework and so on. But of course, now there is more awareness. When we started more than 10 years ago with uh, local varieties of cereal, this was something, you know, some kind of a curiosity. There's only a few people uh, following this, but now it's a mainstream business and it goes under the name of uh, Heritage Grains. And uh, we, we even have situations where people try to put, let's say, a monopoly on a variety because they, um, they, they're building a, a value chain and they start to go big and they don't want other people to use the name even though it's public domain and use all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, you know maneuvering to uh, kind of control this resource um, this is also part of our work is to provide uh, advice and uh, um, in these situations where maybe a community is risking to lose something because uh, <clears throat> another business is trying to make uh, a brand out of it. Yeah, thank you, Matteo. The seed issue is a very big uh, yeah, issue that needs to be researched and and make them available to farmers uh, in a, also in a possibility to exchange seeds among them. So yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, if there are no other questions, I don't see anything in chat. I really want to thank you your contribution and your availability. And I think it was yeah really a great session about living labs on different steps uh, and the stage of development and we for sure so through the project we can remain in touch and see how to develop further the collaboration and i see last comment from nikki uh, check out our three minute documentary clips heritage protectors focusing on organic farmers and heirloom seed saver 
savers uh, agroecology. So really related to the topics of today. Thank you very much, Nikki. And thank you everybody for participating. I see that there are still 15 people, I think, not in the video. So thank you everyone. And thank you also, yeah, for the, it was a very long session and not yeah. easy to follow all of them, but it was very rich. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. We keep in touch. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.